Hi, everyone, and welcome to our UCLA webinar. I'm Dr. Linda Erkeley, and I'm with the UCLA Semmel Institute and with the Dementia Care Program at UCLA, and I'm a clinical psychologist, and I'm here to talk today about surviving caregiving. Now, you can ask questions during this presentation. Just go to hashtag UCLA MD chat, and then at the end of the, uh, of the talk, we'll have an opportunity to answer the questions that you Twitter in. So as an overview of what we're going to talk today, it's really about caregivers and the stress that they encounter as being caregivers of individuals with dementia. And you can be a professional caregiver, or you can be a relative, or a loved one, or a friend. And I'm going to talk about strategies that um, are good interventions for people to reduce caregiver stress, and talk about some other important um, factors that are associated with caregiving, like making decisions uh, for moving your loved one into a facility if this is needed, and uh, also some resources that are available to you. So let's start out with an overview of caregiving and burden. First of all, who are the caregivers? Caregivers are you and people like you. Caregivers are the community. So many people at some point in their life become a caregiver. Now the statistics show that over half of caregivers are women. Over half of caregivers are over the age of 50. And that many caregivers, if you look, are married, they work, so they have very full lives, and on top of this, they do caregiving. About three out of four caregivers actually have unmet needs. That means that most people, when they're caregiving, they don't take very good care of themselves. Okay? Now, what is caregiver burden? Think about it as the overall effect that caregiving has on someone's emotional, social, financial well-being, their psychological well-being, etc. And so all of these demands together are what has been, ter been termed caregiver burden. <clears throat> now, if you're wondering, do I have caregiver stress? Do I have caregiver burden? Well, there is a, there is a nifty test uh, at the Alzheimer's Association on their webpage that talks about 10 signs of caregiver stress or burden. And if you look at these, ask yourself, how many of these fit me? Do you have denial of the effects of the disease? In other words, oh, it's not so bad. Mom and dad's OK. But here you are doing everything for them. Do you have anger at the person you're taking care of? Do you feel angry about just the disease in general? Have you withdrawn from your friends? Do you not go out as much as you used to? Do you feel nervous? Do you feel down or blue? Are you having trouble sleeping at night? Do you feel exhausted most of the time? Do you find yourself more irritable than usual? And do you have more health problems? Are you going to the doctors more? Do you feel sick more? And how about your ability to concentrate or focus? If you can answer yes to a number of these symptoms, then you probably have caregiver burden. Some people will say, I can answer yes to all of them. So we're going to talk about what you can do about it. Well, first of all, <clears throat> let's talk about the one other factor, which is what this is costing you as a caregiver. So there's many different kinds of costs, right? The first would be a social cost. How isolated are you? How do you feel? Do you feel like you miss your friends? Are you getting out? And some of this isolation might have to do with the fact that you are trying to very much take care of someone who has isolated themselves. So if you look at this first scenario, this is a quote from a woman who's taking care of her husband. And she says he doesn't want to go out because of his difficulty in walking. And he doesn't want to go in a wheelchair. So this also prevents me from going out. We're very much isolated. Have friends withdrawn from you? And I've heard this from many caregivers that I've worked with. A lot of the times, it's like they don't either want to talk about, their friends don't know how to talk about this, don't know how to make conversation. 
if the demented individual is going out with them. Um, and sometimes caregivers, you know, or people find it just awkward and they don't want to deal with it. So people find themselves being left alone in a very big time of need. And unfortunately, many caregivers turn to alcohol to soothe themselves and to calm their nerves. And this definitely does not make the situation better, either for them or the person they're taking care of. What about mental health costs? Well, there's many of those too. For example, people with depression have higher risks of depression and anxiety, right? Also, they have higher risk of having cognitive decline. So the person taking care of the person with dementia may also develop cognitive problems. And this could be from the stress that they're going through, could be related to the fact that they're neglecting themselves, they're not getting out and exercising, they have depression, and they have more medical problems like inflammation. Okay? And overall, the quality of life as a, of a caregiver is reduced. What about physical health risks? Well, caregivers are at an increased risk for a number of medical problems, including heart problems, infections, even cancer. And you see that they actually have increased rate of use of health services caregivers compared to non-caregivers at a cost of, on average, about $5,000 a year more. And we know that the health of caregivers decreases as the severity of the dementia of the person they're caring for increases. And finally, I think it's important to point out that in one study, they found that overall, caregivers, especially older age caregivers, have an increased risk of death overall compared to people of the same age who are not caregivers. Now, what are some factors that affect caregiver stress? Well, there are a number of them. One of them has to do with the perceived high burden. So what does that mean? That means that burden is in the eye of the caregiver. So caregivers may feel doing the same type of job may have different levels of stress. So one person might feel very stressed out about what they're doing, and another person may not be as stressed out. But what's important is how you feel, not how another person feels. If you feel stressed out, you're stressed out. So listen to yourself. Other factors that affect the stress is how long you've been caregiving and how much you're a caregiver. So do you care, are you a caregiver full-time? Are you a caregiver part-time? And have you been doing it three months, three years, or ten years? So these are factors that affect the level of stress of a caregiver. Fewer uplifts. What do we mean by uplifts? Uplift is what you feel is something positive that you're getting from what you are doing as a caregiver. So many people feel that they are doing a really good deed or they're repaying a loved one for the good care that they received. Another uplift might be people feel that they're learning something from this experience. Others may feel that this is something that they're doing that's going to bring them good karma. I mean, whatever you feel that you can get as a benefit from being a caregiver is called an uplift. Other things that make it worse is if your patient has behavior problems. So you have someone that you're taking care of who might be aggressive or who wanders, for example. If you don't have much social support and you're very much alone as a caregiver, you're doing it but not with much help, you don't have friends. Also, role change. Role change means that all of a sudden an adult son or daughter becomes the parent. Or an adult spouse or partner becomes like a parent to their, to their spouse. So it's, it's not something that we expect or is natural for someone like a, an adult child to change their parent's diaper. These are things that make people very uncomfortable. And so this adds to stress. What about your family as a whole? How has your family been relating to each other over the years? 
because this does not necessarily get better once caregiving starts. It could actually add to the stress. Families often argue about the kind of care that they feel someone should get. They may disagree about who's doing the most work, who's not helping out. And quite often, there are family members that are absentee. They're just not involved. And so we see this, that some people can be overly involved in the caregiving. Some people can be very attached. And there's a lot of disgruntledness. Also is, what's your relationship with the person that you're caregiving for? So how has it been? Have you had a good, loving relationship with that person? Or have you had a stormy relationship with that person? Because that makes a difference in how the caregiver feels about providing the care. So you cannot escape your, your family dynamic or your past. This factors in to the level of stress that you experience as a caregiver. Finally, what are your coping, coping strategies and how well do you meet your personal needs? So can you deal with the depression or the anxiety that you might be feeling? Or do you deal with it? Do you seek help for that? And do you take care of yourself or do you neglect yourself? Are you getting out to exercise? Are you eating properly? Remember, about uh, at least 25% or more of caregivers have unmet needs. So while they're caring for someone else, they're not caring for themselves. We already talked about a relationship with the care recipient. Also things like cultural background um, are important because people with different cultural backgrounds, different think thoughts about aging and caring for loved ones, this differs across cultures and this can affect the level of perceived stress that someone has. We know that women report more um, depression than males as caregivers. And they usually do worse than males as caregivers. And I think this is something to really pay attention to. Having little knowledge about dementia really affects one's overestimating what, what the dementia patient can do. So the more you know about dementia, the more you'll understand how little that that demented patient that you are caring for can really control their behavior or contribute. So having very high expectations of someone with dementia can result in caregiver stress. And in a lot of miscommunications between the two of you, that can result in even behavior problems and just more stress for both of you. Now, patient behavior problems are a large reason, in fact, why people even come to the attention of a doctor uh, who have dementia. They may have had memory problems for years, but it may be other things like wandering, aggression, asking questions over and over again. These kinds of things that are very difficult for the caregiver to, to manage and to emotionally deal with. And this often is what brings people to the attention of doctors. So, getting education on how to manage some of these problems and how to communicate better and relate more to a patient with dementia is going to be very helpful in reducing these behavior problems. And when you think about it, everybody suffers when a patient has behavior problems. Usually a behavior problem in the patient means there's something wrong, that internally they may be upset, they may have a medical condition, that it's a form of communicating something. And again, this is bad for both the patient and the caregiver. Let's talk about aggression and violence, because this is a very serious subject matter in managing um, behavior problems in loved ones with dementia. Actually, aggression and violence is not that uncommon. As you can see, Within about a year of diagnosis, about 16% of care recipients of people with Alzheimer's disease noted that there was violence towards the caregiver. Okay, so the patient is acting violently towards a caregiver. And aggression is a range of behaviors. It can be something like yelling. It could be something like threatening.
but it can get more severe. So throwing things, throwing shoes, throwing cups, grabbing, pushing, slapping, kicking, spitting, and even threatening with weapons or sharp objects. And there's really a range of, of these behaviors in patients with dementia. And not all patients, of course, have these types of behaviors, but if it's occurring, then it's something very important that you must deal with, okay? Now, sometimes caregivers are acting violently or aggressively towards the care recipient especially if they're depressed and feeling overwhelmed. And sometimes it's mutual. So both the patient and the caregiver are acting violently or aggressively towards each other. So it's very important to think about whether a caregiver may be depressed, whether perhaps you should not be living with your loved one if this is occurring, that you're not having good social support, and finally, what's your relationship been like historically? Because if it's been poor with a parent or a loved one, like a spouse or a partner, it's more likely to be a higher risk situation for aggression. So always consider safety first. First of all, when you're working with a patient, try to get some professional advice on how to manage behavior problems and aggression. And there are many resources available for this through books, through um, the internet, like through the Alzheimer's Association, for example, has uh, primers on this. Uh, we're developing primers at the Dementia Care Program at UCLA for, for this. Uh, great books are like the 36-hour day. Um, if your loved one has dementia, learning to speak Alzheimer's, these books all have information, and there are many other books out there. So whatever you like, the internet, something in paperback, it's out there for you to learn about this. Always call the doctor if your patient or your loved one has aggressive behavior. It could mean there's an underlying health problem. It could mean that there's an infection. It could be a medication side effect, especially if it comes on abruptly, okay? Make sure that you get a break because you're, it's natural to feel angry and frustrated as a caregiver. And breaks we're gonna talk about later, but respite is getting away, getting some me time. And again, it may not be a good idea for you to live together. And sometimes this is the reality that comes about with caregiving. And I wanna point out that Adult Protective Services is there for you. Now, when there is elder abuse, this is, can be neglect or violence or even financial abuse of somebody who is 65 years of age or older, or they're dependent on you, meaning that they may be, have a dementia and de be dependent on you as their caregiver, but they're younger than 65. But if you're over 65 and the, the patient is acting aggressively towards you, you are actually a victim of elder abuse too. And Adult Protective Services in Los Angeles is there for guidance and they're there to help in these situations. And I think they get a, a bad reputation for, oh, they're gonna take my loved one away, they're gonna put me in jail. No, their job is to help problem solve and, and take care, help you take care of these situations. So this is an organization that you can turn to and that often professionals, when we suspect abuse, we do report this and must turn to them as well in these situations. Okay, so we've talked about caregiver stress. We've talked about what it is. We talked about how it affects the individual in many, many ways. Now let's talk about what you can do about it. And there are many things that you can do about it. This is the short list, but we're gonna talk about a number of these various options for reducing caregiver stress. Let's talk about education. The most important thing, one of the most important things that you can do is get educated about what dementia is. What kind of dementia does your loved one have? 
Does your loved one have Alzheimer's disease? Does your loved one have Lewy body disease? Because there are differences in how people present or in symptoms. The more you know about dementia and its course and what you can expect to happen in your loved one, the, the more knowledge you have, the better you are equipped to be a caregiver and to cope with the stresses of caregiving. Okay? And there's lots of ways that you can get educated. There are plenty of information about how to solve problems, reducing problem behaviors, improving how to communicate with someone who has severe memory impairment. You can even practice. The idea is to also increase more activities that are pleasant in your life to improve your mood. How would you do that? There's psychotherapy strategies to help you. And again, think about your beliefs of your role as a caregiver. What, what is it that you're getting from it? What are the benefits? What are the uplifts? Now, in addition to education, every caregiver needs support. There are different ways to get support. Not everybody needs the same kind of support, but getting support from someone is essential. So it reduces caregiver burden, it improves the quality of life, and there are many ways to get support. So one would be to have home visits come in uh, by professionals who can work with your loved one. So it could be a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. You yourself may need professional help, like psychotherapy. Support groups are invaluable, and there are many ways to get support now. There are in-person support groups. There are telephone support groups. There are even internet support groups. So seek out support. You can also get support from friends. You might find support through your church or through your temple. Sometimes you have to be, get creative. But I think one of the things to keep in mind is sometimes people don't want to get support because they're embarrassed about their feelings. They're ashamed about being angry, being frustrated. And if you get into a support group or talk to others who are in the same situation as you, you'll find that you're not alone and that these are very normal feelings to experience. So don't let shame keep you away from getting support. Also, you can get home visits and facilitated support groups. You can get combination of interventions from people. And this is what the research shows, is that combining different strategies is most helpful. So don't feel like you can only do one thing. Do whatever works for you. Talk to a friend, read a book, things like that. Go to the internet, look at YouTube for helpful videos. Pretty much, you can work your own program in getting support. The outcomes of support are very positive, okay? We know from studies that you get less upset, the caregiver, with, uh, by a patient's memory problems. It can relieve depression and depression uh, severity. When ca caregivers are happy with their social support, they feel less stressed, all righty? And also, patients benefit from caregiver support. So the more supported and less stressed out a caregiver is, you see that there's a reduced rate of admission to nursing homes, and also people are able to live at home more days before they're placed. So in other words, the caregiver can tolerate the situation better. Now, a minute ago I mentioned respite. So respite is getting rest and getting breaks from the patient and from the caregiver situation. And you can get short-term respite or longer-term respite. Make sure that every day you get some me time. This is very important. Whether it be reading a book, whether it be getting to watch some TV when you put your loved one to bed, getting out and exercising, meditation and yoga to reduce stress, Getting help with housekeeping. So even though you may not be getting help with the patient and this direct caregiving, can you find ways to get help with your other responsibilities in your life? 
because that can lift the burden too. Okay. Now, other, other ways for respite is that your loved one goes and leaves for a while. So day treatment programs. And we have um, some of our community-based uh, organization partners that have programs for this where you can get a break and the patient has a double benefit, can get socialized and be involved in activities. So this is, a, this is an excellent uh, option for caregiver respite. Try to reach out to family and friends to help you with various burdens. Again, support group is considered respite. And sometimes you just have to be able to create, be creative to get help. And uh, you know, I understand that not everybody can afford to financially to do all things. But you can often turn to your family, to friends, to church or temple members, and be creative of where can I get help in my life to take off some burden? Can I get help with housekeeping? Can I help get help with transportation? Can I get help with actual caregiving? And I want to mention one more thing is that some residence facilities actually have what they call respite care. So that if you want to get away for a weekend or go on a vacation, you can actually have your loved one stay there and taken care of while you're away. And they call that respite care. And we talked about up, uplifts already. So essentially, always think about what, is, what are you getting out of this? What are the benefits that you can think of for yourself um, from being a caregiver? Exercise and nutrition are, is essential. First of all, it improves your health. Second of all, it improves with your stress. So getting exercise, whether you walk or do yoga, et cetera, is important. There are studies that show that meditation is an effective intervention for caregiver stress. So Dr. Helen Lavretsky at UCLA has done work in this area. And essentially, one study that looked at this inter, inner resource protocol they found that six weeks of meditation and breathing and yoga actually reduced caregiver stress compared to a group that didn't get that program. And so it improved depression, improved anxiety, and it improved something called self-efficacy, which is like feeling good about yourself, self-confidence. Now what about if your loved one gets medication for behavior problems or for dementia. Does this help you as a caregiver? And the answer is, it depends. It really depends on the individual. There's not been a lot of studies on this. And so the ones that are available show really inconsistent evidence that medicating the patient is helpful to the caregiver. And um, I think that you know, this is going to be something that is trial and error. If, if the patient needs medication, I think you have to think about treating the patient. And if this reduces behavior problems, if this helps your patient feel better, then it, it may help you. But um, there's no consistent evidence either way that this is beneficial for the caregiver. Now, what about the caregiver going on medication? Yes, that can be beneficial. Again, caregivers can have significant anxiety and significant depression, and they may need a medication to help them. So these are the results of a study, again, by Helen Lavretsky at UCLA. And what they did, or what she did, was study dementia caregivers. And the uh, caregivers got 12 weeks of an antidepressant called citalopram, or they received the placebo. And the caregivers did not know which group they were in. Okay? And compared with the placebo group, the people who were on the antidepressant had reduced depression severity, reduced anxiety, more resilience, more ability to bounce back, less burden, and, and distress improved. So this is the group here that's on citalopram, and this is the placebo group. And these different bars of these different colors are all the, um, 
the various measures. So for example, burden, uh, purple is a measure of burden. Uh, this is distress. Um, this would be depression. Oops, sorry. And um, this would be anxiety. And so you could see that these, these larger bar graphs indicate that they've improved in these areas compared to the people that were on placebo. Now, <clears throat> we've, so far we've talked about many ways that a caregiver can get help. And most of this is about getting educated, getting rest, and getting support, and if need be, getting on medication and going to psychotherapy. But it, there comes a time in the process of caregiving where you may not be able to do all the caregiving anymore. I mean, everybody should have help as a caregiver, but the person that you're caregiving or giving the care to may not be able to live at home with you anymore. And so we call this advanced decision making. And there are a number of reasons why people may no longer be able to live together, the caregiver and the recipient. And one is that the caregiver is exhausted. Another is that the, the patient develops some medical problem that causes them to be hospitalized and need more care. And remember that anybody with dementia can still get a heart problem, can still get cancer, and that dementia in and of itself is a progressive disease in most cases. And in the later stages of dementia, people get health problems. They can't swallow, they're more likely to, to aspirate, get pneumonia, etc. So as depression advances, people are not just having memory problems or personality changes, they become physically ill. And at some point, the caregiver may not be able to, to really give the appropriate care anymore. And sometimes behavior problems become unmanageable. So this is where the caregiver needs to think about what can I do, and does my loved one need to live apart from me? Now, ideally, these kinds of decisions should be made and talked about before somebody that you're caring for gets to such an advanced stage where it becomes an emergency and you have to hurry up and make a decision. Because this is not a quick process. So if you can have these conversations, ideally, ahead of time, that's great. If you can't, then what you need to do is do your research and look into various places. Talk to people. Maybe you know somebody who's had a loved one at a, a place. Um, word of mouth. Go visit. Have lunch there. And get a feel of the place. And remember, though, that it's important that when it's time for somebody to move, there needs to be a bed available. So that's why planning is really important in these kinds of situations. Expect that when somebody transitions and moves, you're going to transition as a caregiver too. You can expect a range of emotions from being relieved to feeling guilty and to being worried about is your, is your loved one getting appropriate care. You also might think about, well, what about my relationship? You know, I'm the person's wife or I'm the person's husband. What am I now? And actually, if a person transitions to a residence, you're more likely to go back to being the role that you always had, being a daughter or son or partner or husband or wife, and um, leaving the caregiving to the professionals. So you can continue with your relationship with them you can also find new ways to relate to your loved one. Even if somebody can't recognize you anymore, you can still be their friend. So bonds do not disappear when somebody transitions into a new place to live. Okay. An important thing that the research has shown is that the more comfortable the caregiver is with the choice of residence, the easier their transition to their new 
life and the less they worry about their loved one. So we talked about having that conversation ahead of time. And remember that sometimes putting, putting someone, and I hate to use the word putting, but making that transition is really a loving decision, especially if that person needs advanced care, especially if you can't do it anymore. Because if you're unhealthy and you're sick, and you're frustrated and angry, not only is it not good for you, it's not good for your family, and it's not good for the patient. So this can be a loving decision. Another important uh, piece of paper or document to complete while you're, while you're doing this is the advanced care directive. And uh, we actually have a very good webinar on this by Dr. Neil Wenger that's up on the same website. But in other words, as a person gets into the end stages of dementia, they're going to need more and more medical care. And it really is important to be able to fulfill their wishes about what kinds of medical treatment they would like at the end of their life. And the sooner you can work this out with someone, actually, the better. But this is something that is very important to be in place as somebody becomes more ill. So when you're transitioning and your loved one now is living apart from you, you have to transition. You have a new life ahead of you. It's, it's partly the same life, but there are gaps to fill. If you've been caregiving for quite a while, you've been living with someone for you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and that person is no longer in your home, you have a quite a gap to fill. And it's difficult. This, is the, um, this was a study done that actually interviewed caregivers. And this person said, I really just have to adjust to the fact that it's OK to go and have lunch, go to a concert, or you do this or you do that. Sometimes I have kind of had to come to grips with that and how much time I should have to myself. So it sounds like there's a little bit of guilt going on there that, wow, I've got this time to myself. What do I do? OK. And you can still attend support groups during this time. You can continue to seek a professional help and tend to your own health needs. So just because somebody moves out of your house does not mean that you're no longer a caregiver. And it doesn't mean that everything just goes away and you don't, you know, you're, you're fine. All right. Actually, you probably will be fine, but you need to take steps to get yourself back into a life that essentially you didn't have for the time that you were caregiving. So just to want to summarize coping, try to develop a care plan with your loved one. Now, what does this mean? <clears throat> this means when you have someone with dementia, they can't communicate with you like they used to. All right, they don't even understand many of the things that you're trying to tell them, and this can create frustration. So limit their choices, right? If you're looking, if you're trying to pick out an outfit to wear for the day, don't open the closet and say, which one do you want to wear? Put two out and say, would you like to wear this one or would you like to wear that one? So these are some ways to cope. Allow people to still be as independent as possible and, and be part of their own caregiving and get education about dementia, OK? Respite is essential. Emotional support is essential. And taking care of yourself is essential. There are many, many resources out there to, to be there for you as a caregiver and for the patient as well. The Alzheimer's Association is, an, is a national organization with local chapters and all sorts of information, if you go on their website, about legal matters, about caregiving tips, about support groups, and it's a great place to learn about dementia. So it's not just Alzheimer's, but there's, there, there's information there for anyone who's a caregiver of someone who has a dementing disorder. We also have our own GeroNet resource at UCLA where we also have national um, links to national caregiver support groups and our own br brand of uh, education from UCLA. 
We have a support group here at UCLA that I uh, co-lead with uh, Patty Davis. So this is Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan's daughter. And um, she developed these groups to really give back to people, especially as she has been through much of this herself. So these meet uh, twice a week here at UCLA. And uh, I co-lead one of those nights. And Dr. Javier Cajigas co-leads another night. But this is a, a great local resource for you. And um, again, you can con uh, contact Catherine Serrano. But other resources would include Lisa's Care Connection or Jewish Family Services, OPICA. And we also have a UCLA Longevity Center where we provide education about uh, care for caregivers. So I want to thank you all for attending the webinar. I hope this has been helpful to you. And um, now if you would like to tweet in some questions at hashtag UCLAMD chat. And also you can view this webinar on demand at this email, uh, I mean rather at this web address. So now I'm going to take a look at some of the questions and try to um, answer your questions that you've tweeted in. So one of the questions is, how do I set limits with caregiving? So that's a good question. In other words, am I doing too much caregiving? Do I need a break? I think the answer is that you should try to build in as much support as needed for you. One person cannot do it all. Listen to how you feel. Uh, are you having any of those 10 signs of caregiver stress? and try to get support and respite for yourself. So please be tuned in to yourself. And come to a caregiver support group and that will help you because we deal with many specific ways to set limits and to get yourself um, to help your coping and your support. Can caregiving affect my health? Definitely. So we talked about earlier in the slide is that when you're a caregiver, you're at greater risk for medical problems that affect the immune system. Okay, so especially heart problems, infections. You're at risk for more psychological problems like depression and anxiety. And overall, you're at risk for exhaustion. So caregiving is definitely can affect one's health. What are some signs of caregiver stress or burnout? So we talked about exhaustion feeling irritable, angry, denying that you, know, you need the help or that there's something wrong with your loved one or thinking that your loved one you know, can do more than they can, um, having nervousness. These are all signs of, of caregiver burnout. How can I relieve stress? Again, the most important things would be education, support, and respite, and do not neglect yourself. Always try to fit in some me time every day. And why do caregivers need support? Because your health depends on it. And also because the person that you're caring for depends on you. And if you are not well, then you really is going to compromise your ability to be a good caregiver. So do it for yourself, also do it for your family, and take care of yourself for the one that you're taking care of. Any more questions? Okay, so I wanna thank everybody for coming, and um, again, you can, you can look at this web webinar on demand if you need to pick up some extra tips or see anything again. Thank you all. <laughs>